The Indianapolis 500 has become the classic automotive drama of engineering skill in challenging time and distance. As in all great events that capture the imagination, the spectacular story of the race itself on Memorial Day makes the headlines. Too often unmentioned is the infinitely painstaking effort by those who build and maintain these precision machines. When the track opens for practice early in May, the dreams that began in ship from Portland, Oregon to North London, England, become the reality that must be proved beyond a shadow of doubt. Stakes are big. Prize money has soared from $10,000 in 1911 to half a million dollars today. The questions asked in the garages must be answered by the driver on the track. It's hard to exaggerate the skill and the courage of these professional drivers, who, with full knowledge of the risks and the prize, push these precision machines to the brink of disintegration. Although the mechanics now take their hands off the car, mechanics now take their hands off the car. They never take their eyes or their thoughts. They build it. He drives it. This track appears to be a simple circuit with only four left turns, but it's the hardest course in the world to drive at winning speeds. The pressure is on through each corner and straight away. At 250 feet a second, there is no time to relax. cars come back to the pits in practice, the lines are drawn. The lightweight rear engine cars are faster than the front engine offies that have been unbeaten since 1946. Parnelli Jones, last year's winner, is sticking with Old Faithful. The big question, the rear engines may have an edge on time, but can they stay the distance? Amazing new developments in improved tire wear and durability characteristics promise not only higher speeds for all cars, but a 500-mile race with no tire changes. With four on the ground they can depend on, the driver and the mechanic search out together the combination for the fastest way around. Climb. When practice winds up, there's talk that just to get in the race will take more than 1963's record speeds. The two weekends before the big event are set aside for time trials. The starting field is limited to 33, and only the fastest of the entries will get in the race. For the hundreds of thousands of fans for whom Indianapolis is Mecca, just qualifying for the 500 is the pinnacle of achievement. This is 
the run the crowd's been waiting for, Bobby Marshman, who turned an unofficial 160 mile per hour lap in morning practice. He bobbles a bit in the corners, but straightens out. As Jimmy Clark, ready on the line, here's the speed. 157.867. Marshman feels he should have done better. Jim Clark is on his way. He came within seconds of winning last year's race as runner-up to Parnelly Jones. Scott is playing now. set. Clark, Marshman, Ward. All rear-engine Ford-powered cars. Parnelly Jones, defending champion, is on his way. Moving through that first turn. Parnelly pours it on, averaging 155.099, over three miles per hour faster than his record pole position speed of last year. But he's not too happy with it. The number one on his car identifies the current national champion. Only 29 years old, Foyt is acclaimed as one of the all-time great drivers. Foyt, with a choice of rear engine or offy, decided, as Jones did, to stay with what he calls his antique Offenhauser. A.J. won the 500 in 1961. Foyt qualifies at 154.67. Like Jones, three miles an hour faster than last year. But again, like Jones, giving himself something to think about. In the practice, during and between time trials, others have more serious problems. Bud Tinglestad. Dempsey Wilson. John. Chuck Rohde. Ed Costana. Chuck Arnold. a fantastic job of holding three wheels to a straight course. Others, just as brave and skillful, but perhaps with more racing luck, fight their way into the select 33. Speeds are 
averaging four and a half miles faster than 1963. Eddie Sachs qualifies. Three Novi's make the field. For years, they were the only challenge to off the domination. Now there is one V8 for every two four-cylinder offies. By the last hour of the last day of qualifications, there is only one spot open and a score of cars that would like to make it. Bill Cheeseburg qualifies number 62 with just minutes to go before the final gun sounds. His speed is good enough to take the 30-second spot, putting number 21 on the bubble. Winnie, number 68, qualifies. Here's a really happy man. Number 68 takes the 32nd spot and drops Cheeseburg to the bottom of the list. The 33rd position is up for grabs as long as time trials are open. Four minutes to go. The longest four minutes that Cheeseburg will ever spend. Brody's speed is not good enough, but there's another car on the line ready to go as soon as the track is cleared. 20 seconds. 10 seconds. Nine, eight, seven. race cars is filled to capacity. The infield accommodates 100,000 fans and 25,000 cars. There are reserved seats for another 155,000 spectators around the track. The Memorial Day Classic is the same, yet different, every year. Constant are the tradition and the parades that have come in 53 years to surround the 500 with the tunes of marching bands and their twirling majorettes. Before the race, it almost seems as if the carnival atmosphere and the race are intertwined, but they are not. As the cars move into starting position, the overture is over. The ever-changing drama of men and machines defying time and distance takes over this great stage. The chief actors are now the drivers. The mechanic's job is done. 29-year-old veteran A.J. Foyt is relaxed as he waits out the final minutes. Hansgen, 44, is a rookie. over the great speedway as the final seconds tick off. Racing fans, this is the big moment we've been waiting for. Here is the president of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway with those famous words. Now, Mr. Tony Hallman. Gentlemen, start your engine. Pace car pulls away with Benson Ford at the wheel and Tony Holman beside him. The 33 cars move into position for the parade lap. 11 rows, three to a row, $10 million worth of equipment the finest assemblage of cars and drivers in the world. The 
Indianapolis 500 Mile Classic begins with a flying start. The field comes off the fourth turn into the front straightaway. The pace car pulls off the track into the pits and the race is on! Clark shifts into high gear and jumps into the lead. Harley Jones inside second row charges right after him. Second turn, the leader's jockey for position as the field settles down in the groove. The back stretch. Going into the third turn, Marshman comes up on the inside and dives into second place. Into the straightaway is Clark, Marshman, Ward, Jones, Point, and Gurney. End of lap one, speed 149.750. This is a 500-mile race. Speeds are held down the first lap while drivers get the feel of driving in traffic with full loads of fuel. Lap two. Clark, the leader, picks up the pace to 152.156 as the field strings out. Clark, with Marshman right after him, charges down the home stretch. Look out! Fire at the head of the straightaway! Here's what happened as caught by slow motion cameras. The tragic crash started when McDonald, number 83, running 15th, spun, coming out of the fourth turn. Number 83 careens off the inside wall in flames. A long, fiery slide right into the path of Eddie Sachs, who piles into him. Here is another view as both cars explode. Rutherford, trying to get by, rides up over Unser's Novi. Duman smashes into the wall. Duman gets out before the car bursts into flames. Chuck Stevenson and Norm Hall are also involved. race is stopped, the first time in 500 history because of an accident. Two drivers died in the crash, Eddie Sachs and Dave McDonald. Five others are out of the race, but they are able to walk away. Norman Hall, Ronnie Duman, Bobby Unser, Johnny Rutherford and Chuck Stevenson. When the track is cleared, 26 cars are rolled down the home stretch. They line up single file, ready for a new start, in the same position as when the race was stopped. The professional race driver accepts racing on its own terms. He's neither a daredevil nor a hero. This is his chosen job, and he does it the best way he knows how. when you start in the same position as when the race was stopped. The professional race driver accepts racing on its own terms. He's neither a daredevil nor a hero. This is his chosen job, and he does it the best way he knows how. Once around in a warm-up lap, and they're off again on lap three. Marshman charges after Clark. Eddie 
Johnson can't get going. Boyd and Jones battle for fifth place. Marshman is catching Clark. They begin to lap slower cars. Marshman number 51 cuts down low. Clark number six tries to go around and gets boxed in. Marshman takes the lead. Chief Buckley watches as Bobby pours it on and pulls away from the flying Scott. Harshman turns a 157.6 lap, the fastest competition lap in 500 history, and stretches his lead over Clark to 27 seconds. Buckley signals him to take it easy, but Marshman is still charging. He's in trouble. He's spraying oil. On one of his low passes, he bottomed, tearing a hole in his crankcase. The caution flag goes out. Stewards are getting ready to flag Marshman in. Beckley gets the news from an official and takes off to see the chief steward. But Marshman is already on his way back, on foot. Number 51 is parked in the infield as Jim Clark takes over first place. The first of the leaders to pit, Roger Ward, who inherited second place when Marshman went out, overshoots his pit and takes his crew by surprise. Jones and Foyt charge around the slower cars, battling now for second place. A fuel mixture control on Ward's car jam, causing high fuel consumption. Clark has a six-second lead over Jones and Foyt. Something's wrong. Clark is scraping along with his rear wheel laid out. His rear suspension gave way and collapsed. Point in a wheel-to-wheel -wheel battle for the lead. Ward charges into the pits again for fuel. There's Point rolling down the home stretch without Carnelli. 140 miles, and Parnelli Jones is making a scheduled pit stop for fuel. No tire changes are necessary. And his crew strains to get his tank filled and get him out. There's a man in a hurry. His fuel tank explodes. Alcohol fumes on and in the car burn with an invisible flame. Connelly scrambles out of the car and rolls on the ground. Nearby crews come to his assistance. His fire-resistant coverall protects him from any serious injury, but he's out of the race. Foyt gets the word from his crew as he charges down the straightaway. A.J. Foyt, the leader, pulls up on Ward, who's in second place, and passes to put number one a full lap ahead. Bob Byth in white number 54 passes Herdebees in red number 56 to take third place. Lap 74, 185 miles, and Foyt makes his scheduled pit stop for fuel only. Ward takes the opportunity to close the gap and pours it on. Foyt 
charges out of the pits as Ward heads down into the straightaway. He's only nine seconds behind. He closes in on Foyt. But there's activity in the Ward pit. His crew is getting ready for another fuel stop. headed by A.J. Watson, does a fabulous job with one of the fastest stops on record. But with the car's high rate of fuel consumption, Ward will have to make at least two stops for every one of Foyt's. He doesn't have a chance to catch him unless Foyt develops his own problem. But Foyt keeps moving smoothly along. The last lap, the race grinds on mile after mile. Troy Rubman spins. But he's all right. Bill Cheeseburg blows an engine and does a magnificent job controlling his car into the infield. Bobby Grimm spins as the race goes into its very last minute. At the end of the race, 12 cars time in Indy history. A.J. Foyt has a firm hold on first place, one and a half minutes ahead of Roger Ward. The checkered flag for A.J. Foyt and his Sheridan Thompson special. His jubilant crew runs down pit road to meet him in victory lane. The confidence of the hard-driving Foyt and the Offenhauser Roadster pays off to the tune of $155,000. Once more, perhaps for the last time, King Offie beats off the pretenders to the throne. This has been a day of victory and tragedy, of successes and failures that will long be remembered by the homeward-bound fans. In this 500 run, it is not always just the names of the winners which live in memory.